Hey guys, Harrison Warren back at it once again with a brand new video for you. Welcome to episode 19 of our MotoGP 13 career mode. Let's play. It's been a while since we've done this, so let's have a quick catch up with the tables. Last time out, we got a couple of wins, so we're now 20 points clear of Scott Redding in the championship race with four races to go. Paula Spagaro and Mika Calio keeping in touch as well. So, without further ado, let's get right into it and it gets around 15 of the season. Well, actually, technically speaking, it's actually 14 because we skip Laguna Seca because Laguna Seca is a MotoGP exclusive race. Um, so, technically speaking, it's round 14. But whatever, it's still Malaysia. Let's go. According to the Oceanic block of... This is like the Oceania Asian block of the season now because we have Malaysia, then we have Phillip Island and Australia, then we've got... Um, then we got Mategi in Japan, and then we finish up back in Spain for Valencia again. Um, let's pick a different rival because that's always fun. Let's go Dominique Agata because we can. Yeah, I like a challenge. Agata's one of the better riders, one of the most underrated riders, I think, in Moto 2. Um, so yeah, so apparently 25% race, which is difficult. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. All right. Also, I kind of want to talk about the BT Sport switch over for MotoGP coverage in the UK. Um, just as soon as we get going, race-wise, we just want to settle down into a rhythm first. So, once we get past that stage, um, I'll talk a bit more about that. But, uh, again, could be a little bit rusty because, again, I, I, I tend to leave long breaks between games I actually end up recording. So, it's a little bit irritating, but uh, just got to try and get around that. Also, again... Apologies about my mic situation. It's just when I breathe out of my nose, it goes into the mic. It's really irritating. Nothing I can do about it, really, because you can't help but breathe out of your nose sometimes. It's just one of those things. So, you know, if it happens, I'm sorry. But, um, all right. Malaysia, one of those tracks definitely designed for a lot of overtaking because there's a lot of medium and high-speed corners thrown around as well as two massive straights. You know what tilt's like, right? If anyone knows what Herman Tilk is like, you'll know from you'll know for a fact that he has a lot of these kind of tracks where they have maybe one or two massive straights, and um, just a lot of high speed you know, right angle kind of corners. Right, quickly before I start this off, I'm going to bring the gearing down a little bit now because we're not going to reach our top speeds because it's, it's, it, as you can see, it's now heavy rain out on track. It's practically a monsoon out there. Um, so, let's get out there and do this. Let's see what we can do. It's been a while since I've played, but I hope I'm not too rusty. Okie doke, we're off. Just four races left in this season. I know if I can get three more wins, I'm, I'll be guaranteed champion. It's just a matter of closing the deal now. Oh, oh. Bit of contact there into turn one. Also, before, also, uh, a couple of things I want to get off my chest quickly before we start as well. Number one, I didn't mention it on video because it happened before, before uh, my last recording was before it, but rest in peace to John Button, father of Jensen, Formula One world champion. Um, I'm very sad to hear this news. I mean, John Button always seemed like one of those, seemed like a really nice guy. He was always. Um, Always smiling on TV. He always seemed to have a tremendous amount of pride for his son. He was also a great rallycross driver back in the day as well, and during the sport's early days. But um, John Button always seemed like a really nice guy, and uh, he seemed like the paddock seemed to love him. Um, you know, I've seen a whole heap of drivers come out and say, you know, he was a friend. He was a really great guy, and he, he always have a lot of support for him. I think Alonso had a really emotional, and Weber had a, a lot of really emotional tweets about him as well. So it's one of those things where it's, it's, it's sad because John Button seemed like a really cool guy on TV. And the thing is as well with him is that I love that he was always super supportive of his son and he was always there for him, but he never made it about him. Very humble as well. Um, never got in the way of his son's success. Never took anything away from his son's success. Something I wish more people did when it comes to families. I know like, I don't, mean this, I don't mean this in a nasty way, but I think Anthony Hamilton is an example of a guy that tried to make it a little bit about himself. 
when when like when Hamilton debuted in Formula One, how many people were interviewing his dad? He seemed just to soak it all up like he was some kind of part-time celebrity. <laughs> But don't get me wrong, Anthony Hamilton deserves a lot of praise for getting Lewis to Formula 1. He was working three jobs at one point to get to fund Hamilton's dream of making it in a world. And that could got me as a big off there. But you see what I'm saying? Like, I think Anthony Hamilton took a lot of the credit for, for Lewis getting where he was. And you know what? Maybe he deserves it. But I think I like that John was a, was a lot was so much more humble about that kind of success that he had. Again, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe, maybe that's how I saw it on TV. But... Um, Rest in peace, John. And, you know, I, I dedicated yesterday's video to um, all the Jensen Button fans out there because I know there's a lot of you out there who watch, um, who are loyal fans of the show. And um, I, know, I, know, I know I follow a lot of Twitter fans as well who are Jensen Button fans. So that one yesterday was for you guys. Um, I know it probably doesn't mean much, but, I, you know, I hope it helps. Um, I'm here to entertain. I'm here to, you know, at least try and restore a little bit of happiness, even though I know it's difficult to accept and you know it's difficult to deal with and you know, everybody deals with these things in their own ways but you know um it's like i said rest in peace john and um i said obviously my thoughts go out to jensen his his friends his family and obviously all the fans of the show who are jensen fans of course because it's going to be uh something as well so yeah take care papa smurf as, as all the, as the paddock used to call him um also i want to apologize for yesterday's video if anybody had an issue with me passing fernando alonso on that video yesterday as well and i'm talking a lot about formula one and a moto gp video but bear with me for a minute guys um just want to say as well um at the time when i recorded it live it didn't feel like i um it didn't feel like i tapped him i didn't hear it i didn't hear the tap i didn't see that i didn't see the tap um, Code Masters didn't punish me for it or anything like that, so I, I assumed that I didn't hit him. But I looked back at the raw footage, you know, without my sound over the top, and I did hear a nick. I think I may have caught him with my rear wheel. Um, so if anyone has an issue with that, then I apologize. Um, obviously, it was a total accident. It was not my intention at all to hit him. I thought I got him clean. And if I didn't think I got him clean, I would have given him the place back or taken any penalty Cody's had given me. So, like I said, apologies for that. If anyone has an issue with it, now it was never my intention to hit him. So yeah, sorry if you, if, if you guys had an issue with that. Anywho, MotoGP, and I haven't really had a chance to speak in depth about the uh, the, the broadcasting switch too much, because as even um, I've talked about it a little bit here and there, but it's a bit frustrating because. You know, we saw Eurosport say uh, have this really emotional goodbye for their MotoGP coverage, and you know they had this really fantastic montage at the end with with all these great moments said there. And I remember almost all of them, like Valentino Rossi's some of these, some of his win celebrations. Uh, you know, his barge with Jibber now. Um, Kenny Roberts was in there a lot. Carlos Checa. You know, people like that. A lot of guys that I used to love watching back when I first started watching MotoGP back in like the early 2000s. It was, it was really cool to see. Um, and I know BBC had this really great farewell as well. And, you know, I'll be honest, it was quite surprising considering the BBC haven't really shown a lot of care towards MotoGP. But the footage that, you know, they, they showed was really cool. And they even brought back old old anchor Susie Perry for one last appearance, which was quite cool. Um, even though, I'm, 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 like I said before, I'm not the biggest fan of Perry as a pundit. Um, as an anchor, I don't think she's that great. And I even said it before, I said, I hope Matt Roberts gets the F1 gig one day. Because I think Matt Roberts was actually a surprisingly really good anchor. Because the two the two forms of, of, of you know, of broadcasting that, that MotoGP had when it comes to the BBC over here and, you know, Eurosport, British Eurosport, was different. You know, BBC had, you know, the live, you know, live Roman reporter kind of style where they had one guy going through the paddock and he had, you know, similar to how Formula One does their coverage now with BBC and Sky. Well, Eurosport was pretty from the commentary booth, so they were just talking over the top, more than likely. And you know, they had they used to have days where they used to have Randy Mamola in the in the pit lane getting reports from him, but they've, they kind of stopped doing that in its later days. Um, so it's kind of it's just two very different styles, but they both sort of worked. But yeah, it's just one of those things where it was kind of sad because I grew up watching all of these folks, except maybe the BBC guys. Whoa. What the hell was Rabat doing there? And again, Rab oh my god. Tito Rabat just f 
friggin' plowed into the side of my bike. The hell is he doing? I'm gonna start it from there, I think. I've gotta brake later to avoid his bike plowing into the side of me. Stupid boy. Right. How's that for speed coming out of that corner? Look at that. Cardio just gets blasted. And again, see, this is the thing. I don't know what's worse sometimes. Like BBC, like what's up, BBC, um, MotoGP's AI or Formula One 2013's AI. Because Formula One 2013's AI is at least aware of your presence. MotoGP is not. They will plow into the side of you and try and take the corner if your bike is there or not. As I'm lining up with Spagro for an outside pass. Comes back on the inside. Got him. Right, now just Scott Redding to take care of. Championship runner-up dude at the moment. Real life championship runner-up as well. But yeah, as I was saying, like, obviously as we know, both of these guys are both um, guys gave up their rights to, to BT Sport. And um, it's a real bad situation for us British fans because not everybody rocks a skybox for one and two. Even the people who do aren't going to pay another £12 a month just to get BT Sport. For those guys that don't know in the UK, Basically, our cable is Sky, and I think I already think cable is a dying format as it is. We like we as consumers are moving forward. I want to talk about this in a future video, talking about the, what the WWE Network are doing about professional wrestling and how they're changing the game with their network plan. Um, similar to make it, but it's basically a wrestling star version of Netflix, if if you guys know already. But I think we're, we're moving a whoa. Reading takes a huge tumble behind me. What happened there? And our Spagro's trying to come in now, my word. Redding's been knocked down into sixth place. Sorry about that, I got distracted there. I was just had Redding plow into the back of my bike. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, like how the WWE Network are changing, changing the game with pro, with pro wrestling by you know basically having a wrestling style Netflix kind of program um, or app, I should say, coming soon to all consoles and TVs, which is, you know, for sports coverage is a game changer. I, um, again, I'll talk about that maybe in a Drake Talks rather than an online racer, but I think Formula 1 is missing a trick there, to be honest. But um, I'll, talk, so I'll talk about that more in a future vid. Um, the thing is, is like, BT Sport is on a cable program with Sky uh, in, in the UK. And you've got to pay for a Skybox in the first place. And you're paying at least £18 a month for it. And you, you don't get an awful lot for that money. You pay a pound for all the entertainment like packages, like all the entertainment programs. But where Sky really make their money is the movies and, and the sports. For Sky movies, you're looking at £10 a month. For Sky Sports, I think it's £22 a month. Yeah, £22 a month. That's 40 bucks it's to you and me, to all to the American viewers out there. That's 40 bucks a month for its Sky Sports pro pro programs. And to be fair, it's almost worth the price because Sky's sports coverage is second to none. Nothing even comes close in this country. So for many people, they're almost forced into buying Sky Sports because of all the football coverage, the American football coverage, um, you know, almost everything. You know, now they've thrown Sky Sports into the mix as well with Sky Sports F1 and their Formula 1 coverage. They've, they've invested millions and millions of pounds in over the last two seasons. So that's now on top of that as well, which is another thing to bear in mind. But you've got to pay £12 a month on top of your Sky subscription, whatever, whatever that cost is for, to get BT Sport for MotoGP coverage. Now, don't get me wrong. BT Sport has got a lot of live stuff on their channels now. They've got the WTA now for tennis. They're now going to have MotoGP. They get a fair few Premiership games as we get the win there um, in Malaysia. But um, I completely forgot that was the final lap as it goes, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, it's like I was saying, it's like they're getting a lot of live sport coverage over there on their side of things. UFC included as well for you mixed martial arts fans out there. They're doing a really great job. But um, on top of that, it's just one of those things where having to pay even more money is going to be awful because this is going to be the first time in years you've got to pay for MotoGP coverage. It's no longer on a free format, which is awful for guys like me, awful for TV journalists like that because now you, you've got to realize we've got to pay to watch this sport now. It's awful news. 
um, you know, for a guy like me who is a guy that wants to make full-on race reviews of MotoGP, Moto2, and Moto3 um, later in the year in April when the new season starts, I've got to make a decision. Either I've got to start illegally streaming these races or pay a ridiculous amount of money basically to either one watch it on bt sport or b maybe buy moto gp's video pass on their website to watch it live i do like the fact that moto gp gives you the option to watch their videos on watch their races online it's something that i think a lot of other sports should try and take up in hand i know a lot of sports actually already do it like um the nba's game pass the nfl's game pass and places like that but i think formula one is missing a trick by doing that but i'm glad moto gp do things like that but you've got to pay. It's, it's, it's 100 euros for a season. And that's, again, that's a lot of money. That's £88 pounds for a season. It's almost the same as getting a BT Sports subscription for a year. Um, or even enough to cover a MotoGP season, which is about 100 quid. So that's very expensive money just to watch a sport. So I might have to start going down the road of watching on a VIP box TV or a first row just to watch these things live. It's really irritating, but sometimes... You just haven't got a choice. It's 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 not fun. I don't like having to do that. And when you've had years of live coverage, it's just not a very nice situation to be in. But that's the reality of big business. You know, it always talks. You know, it's kind of like the Valentino Rossi Jeremy Burgess situation when they just when they announced their separation. What that sounds like a really civil part. That sounds like a civil partnership when I know I think about it. Um, but. It's one of those things where it's not a nice situation and it kind of forces the hand of a lot of British viewers. Do you watch illegally over the internet now? Because I know a lot of people do for most sports, especially in America, where we don't get a lot of American sports coverage, you know, even more so because, you know, for example, the NFL is almost exclusively on Sky. We might get, like, basically when it comes to the NFL, we get the Sunday night games on Channel 4, but everything else is on Sky now. Again, you've got to pay for Sky, so... You know, it's one of those things where do you think it's worth it money-wise, but that's a debate for another day. Let's do Phillip Island. One of my least favourite tracks in the game, and, you know... The Phillip Island thing was something else last season, too. For those guys that aren't big MotoGP fans, but are still watching for me, I let me to give you a heads-up on the situation. During free practice... Um, on the weekend of this race last year, right towards the end of the season, when the season was coming close to a pivotal time at the top, you know, Scott Redding in Moto2 and, you know, Mark Marquez in MotoGP were on the brink of winning their championships. Um, but then they found out that late on that the track service at Phillip Island had been relayed. And as a result, they didn't test tyres around here to see how they would cope with the new surface. The answer to that was badly, and they had to basically come up with a solution about this because basically they were struggling to put a race together. They had to reduce the number of laps down, I think to 22, I think it was in the top class, and in qualifying, Scott Redding took a massive drop which ended up killing his season pretty much because he couldn't come back until Mategi and even at Mategi, he was struggling. Only qualified in like 15th place, and then it was taken out by Tito Rabat on lap one of the actual race, which which pretty much gave the title on a silver platter to Paul Espargaro. Now, don't get me wrong, Espargaro was, was nipping away at his lead pretty much the whole second half of the season, but Redding was robbed of at least a chance to defend it. And obviously, we had the fiasco over here where the MotoGP race itself only, only became 19 laps because the tyres were so were shredding themselves so bad that they couldn't guarantee their safety beyond 10 laps. So we had the rule where you had to, you had to take a mandatory pit stop. Um, so you had, you, had to, you had to take a mandatory pit stop after lap 9 or 10 and change bikes to a new set of tyres. It was like watching a Formula 1 Grand Prix, but on crack. Um, now, I must admit, I have to give Dorna their credit for being able to come up with a solution to a problem that was, you know, on paper, really bad. Um, like, we, we, were, we were having the idea of a cancelled race being floated around, but they managed to find a, a solution which was actually quite good. Um, you know... 
in the grand scheme of things. Even though it was quite crazy and, you know, Mark Marquez ended up getting shafted by his own team for being unable to count. Um, basically, for those of these guys who didn't see it, Mark Marquez did 11 laps on his stint and was, and was then black flagged and disqualified. Which, to be honest, is a little bit harsh, but then again, how hard is it to count the number of laps you've been on? There's a question for you. How did the Repsol team mess that one up? <laughs> What, you can't count to 10? Uh, like, who co like, who was responsible for that cock-up? It, it nearly cost Marquez the title. The title probably wouldn't have had to have gone to Valencia if it weren't for Marquez's, or what, Marquez's team's foul up there. Also, what doesn't help me now is that I'm on Philip Island in the track, which is very fast and very short. So I've got a lack of time to try and chase down the rest of the field, and I'm not that much faster than everybody else around here. Fitted Pile is actually one of my weaker tracks in this game. But yeah, it's one of those things where that Fitted Pile fiasco was pretty crazy. But like I said, I think Dorna deserves some praise for actually coming up with a decent solution. And you know, I'm, I'm already excited for next season. I've always I've mentioned it before about how loaded the, the lineup is in the top class. I'm excited to see what Cater and me, you know, being the perennial Formula 1 team, can do in MotoGP. Or this should, be, should that be Moto2, I should say. Um, that's, that's, that's going to be fun to look out for. Uh, I'm looking forward to see if Lorenzo keeps up this new kind of more aggressive Jorge Lorenzo we've seen. Because at the start of the season, Lorenzo was playing possum quite a lot. Like, Lorenzo was, like, being really conservative. Which was actually, you know... Not that fun to look out for, actually. I must admit, like, Lorenzo was like, he had, he had Marquez all over him, and then Lorenzo was playing super defensive the entire time. And that wasn't fun to watch. As the season went on, he was getting more and more sick of Marquez being ahead of him all the time. Lorenzo got more aggressive, and I, it, and it made Lorenzo really fun to watch. Even though I think he took it a little bit too far in Valencia and kind of got away with it because it was the final race. He kind of got away from you know, pretty much bumping Pedrosa off the road. Um, even though I think Lorenzo tactically got Valencia all wrong. I think he was trying to back the pack up um, to give somebody a chance of passing Marquez, but no one could find a way around. So Lorenzo pretty much thought, fuck it. <laughs> I'm going to put my foot down here now. I'm tired of this. Whoa, look at all this craziness going on over here. These guys bumping each other like mad. Corsi, De Angelis there. We've... What else we got in that pack? Uh, we've got, uh, we've got Simeon over there. We've got Nico Tirol further on, who actually won the final race in Valencia last season. One of the more underrated guys in Moto2, if you ask me. But uh, yeah, it's one of those things. I, I, I kind of want to see if Lorenzo keeps up this more aggressive side to him because it made things a lot more fun. Whoa. That was a random drop. Ah. Hang on. I know this bit actually. So this bit's actually kind of dangerous, to be honest, because... Why am I messing this up now? <sighs> Hang on. There we go. See, I'm not strong around Philip Island. That get that kink is the hardest bit to maneuver in the entire game. You're going uphill, we're going blinding, suddenly downhill and changing direction. It's it's it unsettles a bike really easily. Imagine doing that on pro physics. That sounds like my idea of hell. But, um, yeah. Also, this is one of the few places on the calendar where you, where you actually redline one of these bikes. 294 clicks. That's just over 180 miles an hour. The second tier bikes were never this fast in the past, but, you know, now they've got 600cc engines in them. They're now much more interesting. And that right there is one of the fastest corners in the whole game. Take, take that at 150 miles an hour. 
awesome. It's a great track, Philip Island. In, in but it's just a shame it's so short because doing comeback races like this one is hard. Ooh, little munch for to roll there. Coming back up towards the hill again. I've only got one rewind left, so this could be a problem. There we go. I'm losing a lot of time through that bit, though. I've got two laps left. I'm stuck in 10th. This is not good for the championship. Even though, to be fair, I did gain 15 points on Redding. Whoops, on the, bit on the dirt there as well. I did I did gain 15 points on Redding um, last time out, so it's not the end of the world if I finish in 10th here, but I know I can do a bit better than that. Such a high-speed track, though, Philip Island. Whoa, guys in the grass. Thomas Luti in the dirt. And again. Should come through right there. Come through here now, trying to get a fast look at Nico Tsarol. He's gone wild. Again, Calio almost took me out there. What is he doing? What is the AI doing in this game? It's ridiculous. I mean, seriously, like, at least Formula 1's AI means you know where the, where the, the cars know where you are in relation to them. The bikes will just take whatever line is the best for that corner, even if you're in the way. Let's go around the outside of Tsarol. There you go. Now, that's a move. Eighth place, my. This is now a job of damage limitation. I'm not going to get anywhere near the front guys, and by the end of this race, let's just see what I can manage here. Julian Simon is like 2.8 down the road. I don't think I'll catch that up in one lap. We'll see what I can do, but it's not looking good. But you know, we're, we're going to have you know two more races this season. The, the next episode will be the last one. I'll make you a deal. If this episode gets 50 likes, I'll do the season finale tomorrow. Seems like a fair deal. So yeah, 50 likes on this video, and I'll upload the season finale tomorrow. And the move up to MotoGP, which should be fun. And that'll be the last season of this Let's Play. See that Simeon there just, just freaking barged me. That completely ruined my corner, and now Corsi and Tyrol have gone through. You go, you guys can all kiss my ass. It's as late as I dare for this corner. I've got to break late because these guys will plow me otherwise. It's not fun. It's a shame because this is the best MotoGP game ever made by some mile. I think the last really good one was MotoGP4 on the PS2 a few years ago, which I really enjoyed. It's a shame this game still has some severe problems. Like I said, the AI is still a big problem, but it's still a really good game. Don't, don't get it twisted. Whoa, 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 almost spun it there, my god. And now the Andres come around the outside. Oh no, we're going to get beaten by the Andres. Around my, it's going to be a drag race to the line here. I think we just about got him. There we go, 10th place. That's probably our worst result of the season. For Phillip Island is not a good track for comebacks. Yeah, it's a track where you've really got to lead from the front because you get a lack of time to pass people. And seven laps kind of makes it difficult. Um, it's, it's such a high speed track there's ver not very many places you can pass people but the the good thing is Redding didn't win he only actually um, came second but he still took a good few chunk of points out of me 14 to be exact so going into the final episode I know that a win in Mategi will guarantee me the championship 21 points clear on Redding Espagro technically speaking can still win it from here as well he's only 23 points back Calio's got a long shot now of winning it, but it probably won't happen. Calix have now won the team championship. I've got the Repsol Honda bike to use now in free play, which is excellent. 
but um, yeah, overall, I now know that a win in Mategi will get me the title, and Mategi is one of my better tracks, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm strong at Mategi, not so much at Valencia, but we'll have to see how that one goes. Um, but yeah, like I said, if this episode gets 50 likes, I will upload the season finale tomorrow. Mategi and Valencia in full. So until then, I've been Harrison101. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you guys next time. Sayonara.